I'm a writer. So uh, I wrote a short story about it. And in the short story, the squirrels come down from the trees and attack all the, the human population. And a dog in a store saves her owner. So when the squirrels in the story come down and attack it, I needed to know how many squirrels that would be. Is it like one per person? And I had no idea. So I started asking around and it turns out that nobody had a situation. So with a uh, steward about it and I said, we should count squirrels in our neighborhood. And uh, he said, instead of saying, that's a ridiculous idea, he said, yeah, I wonder how we would do that. So we started forming a team in Inman Park, a cartog. It turns out there was a, a squirrel scientist at Emory University that uh, had information on how you actually go out and count squirrels. And then we uh, came across a wildland firefighter who uh, knew how to map things and, and organize large groups of people. And so 10 years ago, we um, went out and uh, counted squirrels in Inman Park, which is a neighborhood in Atlanta, one of the uh, Atlanta's uh, first suburban settlement. It's a bunch of old growth oak trees. It was where I lived. And so we went out and counted squirrels. And we counted squirrels and presented our findings to the public. And we got, we put it on Kickstarter. And we became a Kickstarter project of the year. And so it took off from there. Since we counted squirrels in Inman Park one other time. And then in 2018, we counted the squirrels in Central Park. And I'm going to talk to you about how we did that and the data that we gathered on there. So basically, in this presentation, what we're going to do is just talk about, uh, we, we can skip over the why. We can talk about the why when we do the uh, question and answer at the end. We can talk about the how. And then the what, the what is the product that uh, we create from all this. So I will just jump into the, the how right away. Does anybody have any guesses on how you go about counting squirrels in an urban green space? Throw out an idea. Internet survey. What's that? <laughs> Internet survey. Yep. Yeah. All right. Surprising number of people said paintballs. Hey, you paintball squirrels? <laughs> uh, which if you think about it, doesn't really work out. Name Von Flieger, who was the, as you can see there, International Squirrel Authority. He made his career studying the Eastern Gray Squirrel, and he came up with a methodology and formula for counting squirrels. And the simple way to explain it is, so if you have a park like Central Park, you break down the park into hectares. A hectare is roughly two acres. Central Park has 350 hectares. Then you uh, get squirrel ciders together, volunteer squirrel ciders, and you uh, send them out into the park and they each get assigned a hectare and they spend 20 to 25 minutes counting squirrels in that hectare. You count the hectares twice. So you get a good count in the morning and then you get a good count in the late afternoon. And then you uh, plug it into a formula that Mr. Von Flieger came up with and it spits out a squirrel abundance number for the park. And which is supposed to be pretty as accurate as you're going to get without actually counting every single squirrel, tagging every single squirrel, tra trapping them. Um, so that's the basic gist of it. And so what happens is when you send out for, as an example, Central Park, uh, we had 323 volunteer squirrel ciders and we sent out people into the park. So we did over 700 counts and while they were in the park, they gathered data, not just on the squirrels but on the park. So this is a, the, the tally sheet that we used uh, for the central park count. As you can see, we have, uh, so you would show up into your hectare, right? Your assigned hectare, and you'd start writing down the park conditions, whether it's calm or busy or something else. Other animals that you might cite, litter, dogs were prevalent in, in I think almost every hectare of the park. Litter, temperature and weather, the date, that kind of thing. And then you go about citing squirrels. So people would see a wander around and you see a squirrel and whether it's gray or black or cinnamon, highlight the fur colors. If it's on the ground plane or above ground, a lot of times it was both. If squirrels run up and down trees, other activities, interactions with humans and other notes or observations. We also included a map of the area so that people could pinpoint the location of the squirrel in the park. And then uh, we were able to create, I'll show you here. <clears throat> these two maps of Central Park. So the data that we gathered was, it, it had never been done before. The Central Park has been mapped a number of different times, but no one's ever mapped it from the squirrel's perspective. And so it was like, because you had to get really detailed with it. So this map could blow up to be nine feet long. We blew it up to, to five feet, but it's 
the most comprehensive map of Central Park that's ever been created. And within that, we also created a second map, which is the squirrel's perspective of Central Park. And all those little dots, constellations of dots, uh, are squirrels and squirrel sightings. And each one has a certain color around it. And, and the key on the map at the top, it tells you what color the squirrel was, what the squirrel was doing, and other associated information. And yeah, I can see how you put your head there on the map, but how would people know in practice when they went to the park where the batteries of their head there was? Because yeah. it's quite a big area. Yeah. It is quite big. And how do you do your central part of us? It's a good question. Yeah. So we had to, again, we had to map the park beforehand. And so when they were presented with a tally sheet, the tally sheet would have the, where they could count squirrel. And then if you flipped it over, it had the map of the actual area with like details on it. So you would see like there, it starts with say, there's a basketball court right there, like the core of the basketball court. And then you can, we told volunteers, get to your hectare, stand in one corner of it and then visualize it. And you can see the other landmarks out there that can show you the boundaries of the, of the hectare. And people ask you count the same squirrel twice. Yeah. We, that's part of the point. Is that what brought to you? Uh, they could jump over it. They don't know the heck is there, so they're running. So that's what we did in Central Park. And we released this data. So what we, basically we um, present our findings to the public. And we do so in fun and engaging ways. So the Central Park Squirrel Census uh, full report of 2019 included the five foot long. It included a squirrel supplemental, which is 37 pages of squirrel content, extra squirrel content and observations about squirrels. Um, it also included a 45 RPM record, which was basically, we took all the best notes from squirrel census, uh, squirrel ciders, and we had people record them. So they would record what the, the notes were saying. And then we put it over a, uh, a soundtrack and I can show you here. So this would be. So it's an experiential version of the park and an audio experience of the park. And so that was one of the things that we presented and we did that. And the reason that we do use things like this as we want, it's not just to count squirrels and figure out how many squirrels are out there. It's, it's the same reason that you do a census of the United States, for instance. When you do a census of the United States, you're not just counting people. You're gathering information that creates a profile of what, what the country is like right now and what needs it might have. And the same thing can be said if you do a census of Central Park. You can count the squirrels, but then you gather other information and then you can see, you get a, a generalized profile of the actual green space and, and whether or not it has certain needs, whether uh, there are certain parts that are overcrowded with squirrels or other parts that have no squirrels. And when you have no squirrels, then you don't have diversity of wildlife because practice with predators. So there's a n number of reasons that we found just by doing this, why we count squirrels. Um, so the how, does everybody understand the how we do that? Okay. What? So I'm going to give you an example of the different things that we've created with the data. The Central Park, this was our first website in 2012. And so we basically uh, took the data and explained to people what we were doing. And then we came up with, uh, this is the first map that we created. This is uh, MM Park and you can see the squirrel sightings on it. I live right there. That's the Carter Center. And so we presented it with that map and our cartographer, Nat Slaughter, also came up with data visualization. That's every single squirrel sighted. And the key at the bottom shows whether it's a juvenile or an adult squirrel, what activities it was doing and, and so on. So if you look at it, it comes like the matrix, the ones and zeros become squirrels. And then we'd created a map. This is a rough map of Central Park, or sorry, uh, Inman Park, and the uh, cider comments inside each one. So you could read what was going on in the park at the time. And then why count squirrels, why Inman Park? We did squirrel audio, squirrel shop, how it worked, some photographs, and so forth. All right, we got such a good response that we wanted to do it again. And so we, in 2016, we released our second count 
of squirrels and the Inman Park Squirrel Census. And this particular one, we created a report, a print report that unfolds and includes a map of Inman Park, again, with the squirrel sighted, but it, it includes data visualizations along the way. And in this particular presentation of the data, we started to get a little more experimental. We started um, adding in anthropomorph stories, which scientists sometimes frown upon, but we figured we're citizen scientists, so we're gonna go ahead and have fun with this. So we created anthropomorphic characters and use that to tell the Inman Park squirrel story. Uh, a bit further. We constantly have to tell people that this is real, that we're actually doing this. And let's see. So that was the second one. And now uh, the third one was, as I mentioned, the Central Park Squirrel Census, which was the most intensive one. There's the report and you can see the squirrel sightings. Let's see. And then in March, on March 1st, 2020, as part of NYC Open Data, we organized uh, a casual count of squirrels in 24 parks uh, across the city. And it was essentially designed to give people the experience of counting squirrels and what that would be like. And so it wasn't trying to come up with the squirrel abundance number of each park, but just give people the sense. And so what we ended up having was tons of data and, um, and stories about uh, New York City parks. And so we were trying to figure out how we were going to present it. And so we thought about doing the map thing again, but that just didn't seem to, we'd done it so many times that we wanted to try something new. So we came up with a different way to present the data and that's the, um, 1-800 phone tree. So if you call that number, you can, you know, basically if you, you know, call Visa on the 1-800 number and you go you know, press one for this, press two for that. This is all about squirrels and the data. So it's, if you like squirrels, press one. And if you don't, then you just hang up. And uh, so it, it was a really rewarding way to present the data. What we did was eventually you drill down enough to where you can pick which park you want to hear data about. And so if it's like Corlear's hook park, you push that button and someone reads the data. And before they read the data, Charlie, our New York city intern went out to each of these parks and he recorded sounds from them. So he, and he introduced it, he said, hello, welcome to Washington square park. And then you would just hear sounds from around the area. And then the person would start reading the data over that because we couldn't just do that. And because we, we like to have lots of fun. We also included a squirrel song called tiny little squirrel. So you can hear a squirrel song fortunes, uh, jokes. What else is on there? Oh yeah. There's a, we, when we were going to uh, count squirrels in 2020, we wanted mimes to be involved. We wanted people to go out to the park and then there would be a mime in the park. We wouldn't tell them that there was a mime, but the mime would be looking out for the squirrel counters. And we wanted the mime to interact with them in some way and then see just a little social experiment to see if they would write it down. So we called the mimes. There's a couple of different mime organizations in New York and they wanted to charge us $250 an hour. To, to go out there times 25 parks. And I was like, well, this is a volunteer effort. We can't do that. Can't you just go out there and do it? So long story short, we get revenge on the vines with the, the phone tree. We have people read the data and then there's a button where you can go to hear a mime interpret this data. Mind <laughs> something. So we, it's 30 seconds of silence. And then there's other school stories and stuff on there too. Um, we have sponsors for this kind of thing. A lot of people ask us, how do you pay for this? Sponsors. We had, I don't know if you guys are familiar with MailChimp. They, they supported us for years. And then we have some other sponsors this year. We went local. Gene Kansas is a commercial real estate guy that's doing good things in Atlanta. Rosie's Roofing is an Atlanta roofer. They gave us some money. And then Constellations is a shared workspace in Atlanta. They gave us some money just to, because they believe in art and doing cool things. And so they promote that kind of stuff. Do you have any questions so far? Just about methodology. You said that accounts go into a formula, which you know, spits out estimated abundance. Are there other inputs other than accounts that go into that formula, like about the topography or anything? Like about the topography or? No, it's, it's strictly the, yeah, the squirrel counts. And in the, yeah, within the, so our squirrel scientists, who can explain this a lot better than I can, um, he, the formula allows you to adjust it so that generally if a person goes into a hectare, it's, it's acknowledged that they're seeing about 60% of the squirrels that are in that hectare. If two people count the hectare though, that number goes up 
to 70 or 80 or any, he also factors in the time of day and the weather because squirrels are more active in certain types of weather. So he went through each of the 350 uh, hectares in Central Park and adjusted it based on the conditions and the number of ciders to get the most accurate number. Yeah. And how consistent were the count, counts? Like if, if two people count at the same hectare. It, how consistent? Yeah. Like between like morning and... Yeah, yeah. Well, like, uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, sometimes it varied wildly. And so that, that was one thing we had to keep an eye on when we were doing the counts because you can start to know where the squirrels are in a park. And that, for instance, in the Ram, it's like squirrel haven there. And you need to get a, a pretty good count. You need to, they need to come back with a good number of squirrels in their particular hectare. Otherwise you go, maybe that wasn't that great of a count. So we sent somewhere. To yeah. And then, but then if you like are counting in a sheep's meadow, there's no squirrels there because there's no trees. It's right in the middle. So people would go there and, oh, I got a sheep's meadow. And they'd be like, you see that squirrel. Yeah. All of the data, by the way, from the central park count is available on NYC open data. Let's see here. Yeah. NYC open data. You can download it. It's uh, separated into park data, squirrel data, and stories. And people have downloaded it. You can see it's, it's been viewed 65,000 times and downloaded 26,000 times. And so people have come up with their own data visualization with the data that we've used. Yeah. yeah I was going to ask, what are people doing with the data? Do you notice like parks? department or anyone in an interesting way? It's mostly people have fun with it. Like that it's out of his people who like have been looking for data sets that are solid and, and then can play with it. And it's fun to us because we, when you present, you have all of this information and you present the data, you have to make a lot of choices. You have to cut out a lot of things. And this allows us to just give them all the information. And then we see what they post. And so a few people focused on, um, the black squirrel population in Central Park, which these are gray squirrels, but they just have, uh, just have black fur. And then there's certain squirrels with like black fur, but then cinnamon tails in certain areas. And just noting the pattern of that. Uh, and then, and, and from what I understand, uh, the black squirrel population has increased over the last uh, 15, 20 years. And so it's seeing where they're, where they come in and where they're actually very, they, there's more of them in the North and they've been heading steadily south. And so it'd be interesting to see what, what that turns into in the next 10 years or so. The other thing about Central Park is that a lot of researchers and scientists were excited to see the data because Central Park is essentially an island for squirrels and it's, they can try and get off, but it's, there's no other nearby parks. And so they have to stay there. And so there's a theory that uh, they're evolving in their own way and that more tests should be done on that type of thing and see how they're to live in these city squirrels, basically. Some other patterns that we noticed were um, in the southern part of the park, squirrels were, they would approach you more because that's where a lot of the tourists come in and then they feed the squirrels. And so the squirrels saw humans as a food source. And then in the northern parts of the park where there's less, the squirrels are basically like humans are not uh, a food source. They're a predator, danger. And so they would, they would st stay away from them. But again, you can go on NYC Open Data and just have all kinds of fun with it. Here, watch this. This is an example of what the data set looks like. So these are, this is a squirrel. So it's like an adult squirrel or a juvenile squirrel. Cinnamon color was the main color. Then the secondary colors is on the ground plane. And then other, whether it approaches or is different. Tail twitching, tail flags. We had people record when they heard cucks, squaws, and moans. Those are the three... Uh, main squirrel sounds, and we had, to, we had to teach people what the cuts and walks and bones were. It sounded like, yeah, feelers, all that kind of stuff. And uh, yeah, you, you said it's 2018. Have you done it since then, or do you do it continuously, or did you just do it this once? Yeah, we just did it once, and people want us to do it every year, like a marathon or five k or something like that. And it, the reason that we don't is because it, it is so much work. Like it's, it's a full-time job when we do it. And the squirrel census team, it's all a bunch of perfectionists. And so we're going to create a map. It can't just be like a casual map. It has to be the best map ever created of Central Park. And you know, the writing and the, we're not just going to, we're actually considering what we're going to do next. 
assuming we, we would get sponsorship. One idea is to go to Hyde Park in London. And, and then there's two other parks right near it and count those parks, which that total area is smaller than Central Park. So it would be, but the interesting thing is that Eastern gray squirrels are everywhere in Hyde Park, but they're not native to uh, Great Britain. And they've actually pushed out the, the native red squirrel and uh, some say decimated the red squirrel population because they outcompete red squirrels and they carry a parapox virus that they're immune to, but that the red squirrel is not immune to. And so now you can type in red squirrel population, red versus gray, and, and like seven different websites come up and they map the locations of the gray squirrels versus the red squirrels. And some people take it very seriously. So going over there to shed light on that might be a, a fun project for us to do. We have the one volunteer here, Judy Garza, who she helped not only helped us take all of the data that we collected and type it into our spreadsheets, but she was actually out counting squirrels for us. And you've had some good experiences with that. What is it like to go out and actually count squirrels? It was a lot of fun. <laughs> um, I found out about it. Actually, uh, a friend in Minnesota who knew we liked squirrels had seen uh, something about it and emailed me and said, are you going to be doing this. And so, of course, I immediately had to Google and find out what was going on. But it was also a great way to learn about the park. Your question about how you knew where the hectares were in your area, it was actually pretty obvious. Uh, the, the maps were really good. And as, as Jamie said, what you do is you start at one and go in very systematically. So we were given really good instruction how to do it. The data collection seemed to be very good, very thorough. But like I said, it was just a lot of fun finding parts of the park that you never go into and paying attention. One of the things that I do with other parts of my life are give tours, and I'm always telling my people, look, everybody's so on their phones or whatever, people are not looking, and this forces you to look. And so it was just, it was a great experience. The, the hectares that people count are generated rent, so they don't get to pick where they go and which is probably better for them because they probably pick something familiar and that wouldn't that wouldn't give them the experience uh that they get when they have to go someplace in the park and see a new part of the park that way yeah we yeah david oh i also was a, a volunteer and i have to say that the squirrels are really pretty smart because they allow dogs to go without leash until nine o'clock in the morning in Central Park, and then they're supposed to be on a leash. And really at 9.01, you can see the squirrels streaming down from the trees because they know the dogs are not gonna chase them. And as we already said, there are certain parts of the park where they really congregate. So if I did a count by Tavern on the Green, then the squirrels know that there's a lot of uh, leftover food in the in the trash bins and they're there in the morning going through pulling stuff so it really depends on what part of the park you're in when we started doing this again it's just like we're learning as we go and we realized that no one really had any idea like what is a healthy number of squirrels so like the squirrel abundance number what's healthy and what we found when we counted in park there was the first time we did it i think there was roughly 5.78 squirrels per hectare we thought, okay, that's interesting. And then we counted it again to check our numbers two, a couple years later, and it was 6.14 squirrels per hectare. And squirrel populations go up and down. But that seemed to be like, okay, like that seems to be like a healthy number of squirrels. So then when we came to Central Park, we were curious what it would be, and it, was, it turned out to be 6.78 squirrels per hectare. So you start to find, oh, that's a healthy number. It seems like a healthy number of squirrels. It's like Central Park is a healthy park. Uh, it has a lot of diverse wildlife and it has some different types of tree canopies or tree canopies covering much of the park. And then there's other areas that are wide open. And, and so even though that particular park is different than park down in way down in Atlanta, the numbers are very similar on this world wide number. So I thought that was interesting. The more we do this, the more we know. So it's more interesting. Yeah, so there's a, a lot of cool things that, again, the squirrels seeing humans as a food source and close to the entrances of the parks and then competing with pigeons and, and then in the northern regions of the park that see predator 
the uh, one thing we, you would, every once in a while, someone would see a, a bird of prey that would be going after the squirrels. And the interesting thing about it was that, um, they, you would think that the squirrels would like see it, something was going to kill them and would run and hide in, in their nest. It wouldn't, they'd just stay out there and just kind of be annoyed by it. And then John in, during our 2020 count at Marcus Garvey park, witness, had took video of it, witnessed this incredible fight. Uh, a hawk was in a tree and like what? 10 squirrels? And the squirrels are taking turns, like mission impossible, climbing underneath the branch to then bat at the hawk and run away. <laughs> All the other squirrels are screaming encouragement from the safety of the trap. <laughs> and it, it was marvelous. The videos are on their Instagram. It's, it's, I've never seen anything like that. And I grew up in the city. And yeah, it's life changing. <laughs> there is a, a lot of drama in the trees if you just stop to look up. That's one thing that I learned from it is that I didn't really know much about squirrels at all. And then just started looking, you start looking at them, and constant drama going on. They're fighting each other, they're fighting against the birds, they're ha having to deal with cars, the city life, and all that kind of stuff. So look, and their Atlas Obscura did a, a podcast last year. You guys heard of the white squirrel in Prospect Park? There's a white, one white squirrel in Prospect Park, and it attracts a lot of attention from people. So they went out to find it, they found it. Um, and that's essentially the, the theme of that particular podcast. I recommend listening to it. Is that you just take a moment to stop, to look up. And so Nat Slaughter, he works at Apple Maps, and he's a map genius. And he physically went in and would look at the, the tally sheet that had the squirrel location on it, and as best as he could, he would just and then he used the coordinates for creating the maps. Yeah, I don't think I have a good quality. I don't have a good quality one. Right now, this is our first tally sheet. So you can see how they slightly different. The logo is different. So this is our part one. Uh, uh, first question. You may have explained this earlier. We are doing the census and tracking specific squirrels. Like to know. So that's like how you know it's the same one. But I guess my second question is just during the migratory pattern. So we're doing the squirrels stay in one part. So Everyone, when they talk about counting squirrels, they go, how do you know you're not counting the same squirrel twice? And people ask that question because for different reasons, because there's so many squirrels and you're going in the same area and you just, but one of the things that they insinuate with that is that every Eastern gray squirrel looks exactly alike. And they do, a lot of them look alike, but this is another interesting thing is that when you actually start counting squirrels and paying attention to them, you start to notice little personality traits and, and things about them, like a notch and an ear, or like one, one tails are a, a real big personality trait of squirrels. And so one squirrel might have a really big tail and a cinnamon tail, and, or another one might have a, a missing tail. Even. And so you start to notice a uh, little differences like that. And though, so then yes, you go back out to that hectare and oh, that, there's that squirrel because they, one other thing I want to say about the methodology is that a squirrel generally stays around its own tree. It has its food source right there. And it doesn't wander more than a hundred meters away. You're not counting seeing a squirrel over by the plaza one day and that same squirrel running the track on the reservoir the next day. They just don't travel that far. Uh, they stick around their, their own area. And one, as far as the patterns of the squirrels, and you can look at it online and particularly the, the constellations map that we created, this particular one can't really, I wish I could zoom in, but, and you can see the constellations of squirrels here. They do all hang out together, even though squirrels are generally solitary and they, they can build their own nest and they can live in a tree with other squirrels, but they just work out their own lives and find their own food. They still hang out together, which is interesting. And so it was also interesting to see how humans use the park, like our pathways here, and then where the squirrels found ways to fit in. They've adapted really well to, to humans on the planet. And that's one of the things that fascinates me about squirrels is that there's so many animals that have had trouble adapting to humans on the planet. We've gotten rid of so many of them, and, but squirrels somehow have pulled this little trick where they can live right next to us, but they don't really need us. They can just kind of hang out and do their own thing, but they will take a pizza from you if you're offering it. That's yeah. It's interesting to, to see the patterns of where the squirrels live in relation to humans and how humans use the park and the dogs, as we, as we mentioned. Yeah. The, uh, the it's real at 9 a.m. 
the dogs in Central Park go back on the leashes and you can hear the squirrels calling in the trees. They're letting each other know that the dogs are, are leaving and then they come down, which is, doesn't happen anywhere else. In Inman Park, the squirrels are up at 7 a.m. and running around and, and gathering their food. But in, in Central Park, they can't do that because the dogs are around. So, yeah. What's your background? Did you a scientist? I'm a writer. I'm a writer. Yeah. So I'm a storyteller. And so I, when I, I come at this from the angle of finding the story and the data, and then, and how we're going to tell that. So the, the team is me, a writer, a Stewart, who's a web programmer and artist and squirrel sighting. There is our Nat Slaughter, our photographer. There's Donald Casancio, who's our uh, squirrel scientist. And then there's Josh O'Connor, who is our field commander. He's a wildland firefighter and has organized like, like lots of uh, big projects. So he's the guy that handles that. And then there's uh, Sally Farm. So she's the behind the scenes person that, that deals with all the spreadsheets. So we have this, everyone has their own skill set and, and we get out of the way, let everybody do. Yeah. And, and this is all voluntary. Yeah. For the fun of it. Art for art's sake. We've discovered that, uh, we're told, I think we're told that artists and scientists are two different types of creatures. They think differently, but they're actually very alike. But scientists very seldom question why unless it's part of finding their hypothesis. They don't ever, we've never gone up to a scientist and said, Hey, we counted a bunch of squirrels and they went, why? They already know why they, that's what they do. They go out and they try and figure out the world. And scientists seem to have the, a, a similar sensibility in that they're out there trying to find the big answers to things. And that's been fun to see that. Do you have a question, sir? All right. Have you received requests to do a census of any other animals or wildlife? Yeah, uh, we have one minute. Wombats. There was someone down in Australia that wanted to do a wombat census. Um, was seeking our seeking our assistance and passed them along to the methodology. And wombat census. Last question. Yep. I'm vaguely aware of like, multi-year cycles for our squirrel populations, and I was wondering if your multiple years at Edmund Park shed any light on that. So we were interested about that too. Um, it's the population goes up and down based on environmental, but generally a squirrel in the wild lives to be about three years old. So we held our censuses three years apart and thought maybe would there be some sort of difference, like a new population of squirrels, but the numbers came back close to the same. They're self-governing. They figure it out and that time is up. <laughs> <laughs>